There was one story that I've been wanting to tell for five years, and that's the story of Edmund and Deborah Zake and the founding of Rancho La Puerta. Deborah Zake today is known as the godmother of the spa industry, and most spas today find their roots here at Rancho La Puerta. We had two giant trees, two magnificent oak trees that formed an arch. One branch went over on the other tree and everything, all our early activities were under these two trees. So it really was, we didn't know it at the time, the doorway to our world. Above all is Mount Kuchima. I consider the mountain our guardian angel. The Native Americans held it sacred. I believe it has that very same power today. Deborah says her life was always an adventure, and at a young age, her family moved to Tahiti to live a natural lifestyle. A few months before we left Tahiti, we met the man who would change my life forever. His name was Edmund Seike. He was, to me, the most wonderful man in the world. We came here waiting for the war, war to end. We had to leave the United States or he would be sent back to his country of origin. Well, we're Jewish, both of us, and sending back to Romania would mean sending back to the concentration camp. So we had no choice, we came to Mexico. We rented this little house where they stored hay it had no threshold for me to be carried over. I was a new bride. I'd only been married a few months. <laughs> we came here as a refuge. And at the end of five years, this was home. 70 years later, several of the original structures are still on property, and Deborah gave me a tour of her first home. We were pioneers, and the pioneer spirit was stronger than any other. Not only is Deborah a pioneer, but she is a visionary. Her family's commitment to building a place dedicated to health and longevity secures her place as an American hero. In fact, every spa in the United States has its roots here. Everyone likes hamburgers, so we made soy burgers. We would take cooked soybeans, mash them up, and put seasonings, and we make a little patty and do this, and do this, nice. and voila. In the early days of the ranch, we really tried to recreate that simplicity. The first guest accommodations were airplane engine crates. Well, this represents the great leap forward. I'm always very nostalgic. Thanks to these 30 boxes, we're here today. You have everything you absolutely need, a bed, a washstand, and a chamber pot. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> so if you were to give somebody some basic advice when choosing what to eat, where do they start? <laughs> a backyard garden or some garden boxes on your deck. The fresher the food, the more the value. The day we arrived in 1940, that same day we started the vegetable garden. Depending upon the time of year, we grow from 90% to 50% of everything here on the ranch. And of course, it's organic. You have to, at all times, be doing your best with what you have. The ranch welcomes over 100 guests each week. I met with Barry, the director of programming, to learn more about today's experience. How would you describe the ranch today? The program at the ranch it's changed face a little, but it's still kind of the same program that was when we first started. Back in 1940 and 50, guests still got up and hiked the mountain every morning. And then instead of doing exercise classes like they do now, they worked in the garden or they worked in the kitchen. And in the afternoon, they had lectures by the professor. And now we have guest presenters and lectures in the afternoon and evenings. I think the basic philosophy of the ranch is the same. You can't put your finger on it, but the ranch has a soul. And it's a soul that that just keeps going and it makes us very unique and it's very special. Having spent time here, I couldn't agree more. 
I feel this is a magical place that has the potential to evoke miracles. So a lot of people have been coming to the ranch for a long time. Have you ever witnessed a miracle here? Well, I'd like to think we, 150 miracles every week. The difference on when the guests arrive on Saturday on the bus and when they leave the following Saturday, it's really tangible. Everybody notes it. There's an aura of energy. It's hard to explain. It's just like an arc of energy. It is a miracle. And we have the miracle of a sacred mountain that we didn't even know was here, Mount Kuchima. I don't know how much the mountain has to do with it. But whatever it is, I'm seeing miracles all the time. <laughs> At 93, Deborah will tell you that she's lived a full life and she has much to share on being healthy. So what is your personal definition of well-being? Inner peace. First, you have to know why you want a long life. What is it you want to do? What fascinates you? And then you work toward it. It's making deposits like in a bank. You're setting up not only money, but preparations for that long life. It, it, it's to me, it's kindergarten. But first comes why you want to live. And if you're enthused enough, then it's worth the work. So for me, the, my emancipation, my freedom to be me, to get to know myself, was when I turned 60. When I turned 60, I felt ready for the next. But at 60, if you can sit back and say, wow, what now? It's wonderful. And you look forward to it. And then your years 60 to 90 are the best years of your life because you picked them. Helping people to find joy in everything they do is a great privilege. It's an honor. Deborah Seke shines as a perfect example of how aging is not about being over the hill, but a journey to reach the summit. And from the top, we can see the beauty of a life well lived. Everyone wants to make a difference in their life. And I've been lucky, I've been making lots of differences and I hope to continue doing that. Made a difference in my life. <laughs> Sometimes the miracles we evoke we never see. I feel like it's a miracle that we're here and talking to you. My heart is full and I feel inspired by my time at the ranch. And I should probably get started planning the adventures I'm going to have after I turn 60. <laughs>